Okay, this for now is going to be the final uh, close to 15 uh, about Apocrites, but it's going to go past that. It's going to go into the sequencing between Apocrites and Amenlego Humin because we have that same issue going on in our 2510, Matthew 2510 through 12. So I'm trying to determine what the past usage means about our current time. Again, I, it's not so much about Trump, but about believers accepting or rejecting Bible and then what happens to history as a consequence. Because a major theme of the Bible from Genesis forward is that believers determine history. You see that in the Song of Moses, for example, in Deuteronomy 32.8, which, you know, scholars debate about. Um, the Hebrew of uh, 32.8 says, the history is determined by the number of the sons of Israel. Let me see if I can get that here. Okay. Here's Deuteronomy, where the Song of Moses occurs. And 32. And here's verse 8. It doesn't read the same way in the LXX as it does here. See, that's the sons of Israel. So it's, as you can see in the NAU, okay, that he separated the sons of men, set the boundaries of the people according to the number of Israel. Now, that's poetic language. Here's the KJV if you're stuck on the KJV, which you shouldn't be. It's sometimes the best translation and sometimes not. All the translations fail. What you want is the original. So this is saying, what it's really saying in the Hebrew is that time is organized around the sons of Israel. All time. Okay, because Christ is the head of Israel. I mean, you know, it's, it goes back to Isaiah 53. Which is just one decree, God saying, It's really that's really in Isaiah fifty two thirteen, that's why Isaiah fifty three starts in Hebrew. And it's a decree that Christ exists. That he's gonna be glorified. It doesn't have anything I mean that the whole sin question is just really an excuse to create Christ as a human. Alright? It's really about him, not us. And the reformers never figured that out. The stress in the New Testament is in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. It's because you're in Christ that you go to heaven. And you get in Christ by doing the one rule that God set. Believe he paid for your sins. Because he really did it whether you believe or not. God accepts it, but do you. Okay? By the same token, because it's about Christ, his human body is from the sons of Israel. Alright, so if you're anti-Semitic, you might as well just kill yourself now. Although, it'd be smarter to just say, oh, I don't want to be anti-Semitic anymore. Watch the difference in your life. Anti-Semitism makes you crazy. Everybody surrounding Donald Trump is crazy. They're anti-Semitic. Everything coming out of Trump is anti-Semitic. They cater to anti-Semites. That's how he got elected. And a lot of Christians are anti-Semitic too, so they won't like this verse. But here it is in front of you. According to the sons of Israel, time is designed. Okay? All the nations, everything. Now the problem is that when you get down here, see it says the messengers of God. Not just angels, messengers, any messenger. You're a messenger of God the minute you believe in Christ because you have a message about how you got saved. Okay? And you can be a more formal messenger like a pastor, evangelist, la di la. But the fact of the matter is, once you're in Christ, you are part of Him. And so when they say, Angelon, Teu, the messengers of God, that's a little broader statement. And they're translating Ben Israel. And you can call it a philosophical expanded translation. Because anybody who believed in Christ in the Old Testament was considered part of Israel, whether they were a Jew or not. And the same thing here. Anybody who believes in, in Christ 
is considered a messenger of God. And and th when you start to think about it, that's pretty clever translation because once he pays on the cross, and they didn't know it was going to be a cross in those days, once he pays on the cross, the payment is for people not yet born. So now there's this juridical issue about, well, are all the people that he paid for in advance going to actually be born? Satan's trying to angle to end the world so that that can't happen. All right. And then how many people amongst those born are actually going to believe because he paid for the sins of everybody, but at the same time, God foreknows who's going to believe. And the particular sins you sin after you believe do change. Okay? In some ways your sins are a lot less as you grow spiritually, and in some ways your sins are a lot worse. But Christ paid for them all. Okay, so then if the people he paid for, and they believe... What about all their sins that have yet to occur? So if Satan can get them to die sooner, then the whole promise of God is, is you know, wrecked. That's the goal. Alright, but the point here is that the sons of Israel set the bounds of time. And now this is an expanded translation of that, to, you know, to answer the basic question, who is the son of Israel? Well, anybody who believes in Christ. And, of course, that's the theme of the book of Galatians. Okay, so now coming back here, what you're looking at then is first in the context of Israel proper. But then after that, because this is all about the history of church, to show how this, whoops, this is true. Now, there's a New Testament equivalent to it in the book of Acts that sort of updates it for church. Acts 20, 1726 rather, sorry. I'm really tired, I haven't gone to sleep yet. Okay? There we go. Having determined, see, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitations. And that's, that's absolutely essential that that be so. <clears throat> because Christ paid in advance for the human race, not just for those who are already alive at the time. So the promise of God is that those people will actually come to live. They will live out their lives so that every sin that he paid for on the cross actually occurs. Okay? Whether you're saved or not, that's a major juridical issue, you know. Because God makes his promise, only God knows what he did, because, you know... Humans and angels can't peer into the mind of God. So we're basically taking his word for it. <clears throat> so, how true is this? Well, Christ is sort of answering that question, both here in Acts 26, which hadn't been written yet. And maybe it's written because of it. But he's particularly, you know, reminding the reader of the Song of Moses, Psalm 32a, that part of it. <clears throat> so what he's doing is he's saying now, okay, here's Temple Down, 40 years from when I talk. And next he brings up Hodapokrites, which is the exact same language that applies to our time. Okay. And now the question is, well, why is it there? Temple goes down first. This is the key. The temple goes down first. Temple, body of believers is who we are now. We're the replacing temple. That's Ephesians 2, the two walls. Okay, so the temple that the temple depicted died in 30 AD. He's talking here. He's not dead yet. He'll die two weeks later. Forty years afterwards, the temple dies because Elvis has left the building. Okay, but there's a new building going on. A temple of believers. Okay, so if there's a new building and the new building is a temple of believers, then what's the new equivalent of Psalm 32 8? Because the, the rule about Israel determining history hasn't been rescinded, but it is updated by Acts 17.26. Because Acts 17.26 is about the Gentiles. Okay, when it says the nations, when you see the word the nations in your translation, that means the Goyim. It's the Yiddish word for it. Goyim. Gentiles. Anybody who's not a Jew. Okay? Whether they believe in Christ or not, they're called Gentiles. Alright, so... 
now our question is okay then Hodapokrites is talking about Hodapokrites the next five years after the temple goes down after that's our first key it's talking about a result of something that happened in the prior clause and now that that prior clause has occurred the believer is supposed to know that this is a time prophecy and count the syllables and say okay there is some answer to the event that happened just now temple down and the text is going to tell me how to read it how to re how to orient to it and what's going to follow because the Jew, just like the Christian now, the Jew is always supposed to know what time it is. The Hebrew word for that is la moed, and it means appointment. And so all the prophecy was time, one syllable per year, starting with Genesis, and always focusing on countdown to Messiah. Okay, well here's Messiah talking. He's going to leave the building, and 40 years after that, the temple goes down. But at this point, it's in light of church's existence. Because this is actually a timeline for church. Okay, so now your church, or your Jew, and if you know to read this, because the Jews were schooled in it, it's like, okay, the clause is, okay, the next five years are going to be some kind of answer, legal answer, to the temple being down, which it is. Okay, and if you just go, you, you can just go look up in your history what that answer was. There was a number of things that happened during that time. Okay, diaspora being primary, and of course the diaspora number is 49, which I've covered before. Okay, but now in our sequence, he he's talking. Don't you see all this? And of course, he's talking back in 30 AD, but what he's talking about is going to have some kind of repercussion, some ripple effect that's related to the temple going down that's going to actually occur between 49 and 57 years after he dies. Okay? So, there's something you're going to need to look at between, see, 49 from 30 is 79 AD. What are you going to be looking at there? The death of the guy who took down the temple. I mean, the guy who was in charge of taking it down. And also the um, enthronement of the physical guy who took down the temple. Vespasian was the guy in charge when the temple went down. His son Titus was the guy who actually took it down. Okay, I mean, not, not alone. He had Herod with him and, you know, other troops. And at that point, Josephus was with him, too. But in 79 AD, which is 49 plus 30, three things happen. Vespasian dies. Pompey, the volcano, erupts. And everybody saw Titus take his dad's place. And they regarded the eruption of Pompey as a bad omen. And then Titus himself only lives for three more years. Okay. So, u blepete. Before you even get to the word blepete. He's dead. He's not seeing nothing. You're seeing him die. And his brother, Domitian, regarded as one of the bad emperors, takes over. So, don't you see all this? Now, think about that. Titus, I mean Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian were all present during the takedown of the temple. I mean present in the sense of at one time or another they were actually in the field. But they had some sort of authority about it. Domitian was younger, but he was going back and forth between dad and his brother. Okay? He was kind of like that. He was something of a martinet. And he liked to always take credit for things. Alright, so as anybody's looking at this thing 57 years later, or between 49 and 57 years later, 79 is when Vespasian dies. Okay, then Pompey, then Titus uh, dies. 
and that's 81 at this point 81 right here right there like the last syllable blepete which is kind of satirical and biting because Titus isn't seeing anything but you as a believer counting those syllables you'd be seeing it and you're like oh wow the guys who took down the temple are now as it were judged and Rome is basically judged because Rome inherits the mission okay now that's a common Bible doctrine in the Old Testament that the people who harm the Jews will themselves get taken down. This is a timeline and a juridical answer, see, Dapocrites. During the time of Dapocrites, the, the Romans were busy making a stink about, oh, we captured the Jews, we captured their temple, they're having a triumph in, in Rome, taking one of the candlesticks that was in the holy of Ho in the in the holy place, not necessarily the holy of holies, which was empty. Okay. Bing bing bing. Alright, so this is all causally related and you'll notice it's a sequence. So by the time you get to the very first I'm in Lego Humi. Okay. You're ex this is obviously some kind of explanation about the foregoing cause and effect multiple result rollout and what is he saying there won't be one stone based on another he's talking back to their ooing and eyeing over the temple which Matthew packages so that it'll hit at the 40th syllable so when you get to these syllables with the Amen Lego Humin and its content it's explaining that hi, what went before is a result of the temple falling. So if you weren't sure what to think of Vespasian and Titus, but you did obviously know that they were involved in taking the temple down, he makes it explicit here. But he's also in a, prophetically saying, hi, the Quitos War is going to occur 84 years after I talk, precisely because the temple was still down. Okay, this is what's going to end up making it so that Jews can't even get into Jerusalem. Okay, this is what turns Hadrian, who's in Syria at the time this thing starts, this is what turns Hadrian against the Jews. He had been sort of noncommittal, but this turns him against them. All right. At the same time, there's a certain amount of growth going on because it's not always just bad news. You got growth going on here. You got growth going on even better here. So during those 44 years after the temple falls, some people were learning lessons from all this. Now why am I spending so much time on this? Because the first, and any scholar will tell you this, any Bible teacher will tell you this, Genesis sets the theme for the whole Bible. Every single thing everywhere else in the Bible is some kind of play on something in Genesis. Well, this is a new Genesis. This is a New Testament. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. He baldly identifies it as the first book of the New Testament in the begats if you counted the syllables because he counts his book as being the next book in line after Malachi. And he counts his book writing as the next in line after, after Nehemiah restores the temple. Well, actually, Nehemiah only rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. So he's, he's, he's playing on that. Now, I covered that in the Matthew Meter videos in Vimeo. You can go look them up. It's very extensive. But the point here is that there is a parallel future event that is based on this past event and it's just as bad. Alright? So now we know that I'm in Lego Humin is an explanation that Hodapokrites is some kind of result from the clause just before it having some kind of event. So here's the event, the clause before. Here's Hodapokrites, which is actually a resulting judgment or response to the prior clause and then the things that are said 
if any, in Amen Lego Humin, are an explanation of that prior information and also telling you, hi, here's what's going to happen during the very time of the words. And that the thing that he's talking about is some kind of trend that continued after the prior event here as a result of it. Okay? Now that matters because this same order is in our time. Let me see if I can turn this brighter. Yeah, that's going to matter. Now you should be able to see it better. So you see, here's the event. So it's the clause prior to the Apocrites clause, followed by the Amen Lego Humin clause. And in each case, you're looking at something major, public, easily researched, judgmental, something bad. And they're all related to the first event. Okay, so now we come down here to the next time that he, that Apocrites is used, and that's covering the period, if we just include the Chi, that's covering the period 147 plus 30 is 177, 178, Apocrites makes, makes it five syllables, Chi Apocrites, all right? So it's 148, 49, 50, 51, 52 in the, in the meter, okay? So that's 178, 79, 80, 81, 82. And right here is when Marcus Aurelius dies and Commodus takes over. Now, if we apply what I just said about the temple down and the use of Amen Lego Humin, which is not here, but he's still talking. All right. Then what do we have? We have our defining event that's going to be covered by Chi Apocrites occurring prior. So the end of the clause occurring prior would be 177 AD. All right. Hippocrates is basically addressing that and then covering more results, but the results are related to what went before. All right? What went before with the 177? Well, the, one of the big things that happened was once our boy gets into power, our boy Marcus Aurelius starting right here at, the, at Samayan, that's really rich and biting. As soon as our boy Marcus Aurelius gets in power, because of the kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, culture that he promulgated, um, everybody started to like, oh, he's a great emperor, and now Rome is going to be free. And actually, it started under Ananias Pius. But Rome, Romans kind of got real sneaky about their philosophy and how good they are. And, and Marcus Aurelius built himself out as a sort of philosopher king. And he got a lot of buildup from, from his childhood forward by Antoninus Pius, who got it from Hadrian. Hadrian's condition for Antoninus Pius to come into power was that he also adopted Marcus Aurelius, who at that time was, you know, very young. So now the very young boy who grew up in the public eye of Rome is now ascending the throne of Rome. That produced a lot of, um, how do you want to call it, Rome first thinking. Rome first, Roman culture, Roman this, Roman that. So anything that sort of disparaged Roman culture started to be, you know, people stopped. Like you know, people were less tolerant, kind of like now. All right, that very same year, far away in China, a version of the plague, one kind of plague or another, I'm not sure you could call it the Black Plague, but it was really bad, was starting in China. 
and there were a bunch of troops that were still sitting in the Middle East. It's real important to say this. A bunch of troops sitting in the Middle East come home from fighting, and they bring that plague with them. So you can even go look this up in Wikipedia if you want to. It became known to the people as the Antonine Plague. They blamed, because see, he's coming to power at the same time. They're superstitious. It's like the people who vote for Trump. You know, if something happens at the same time that you come to power, well, you must have caused it. All right. So that's, you know, Samayan is very biting there because it's like that's how people interpreted his rule. And that's what they will end up saying is that, see, the Antonine Plague is coming because of Antonine. You know, Marcus Aurelius, he was one of the Antonines. But because it came from the Middle East, having traveled there from China, because it came from the Middle East, it hits Rome around 165 A.D. This is 168 A.D. Because it comes from the Middle East, then they're looking, and they don't want to, because of the Rome first thing, they don't want to just, they don't want to blame Marcus Aurelius. He's a philosopher king. So they turn to the Jews for blame. Well, it's all you Jews who are to blame. It's all you Christians who are to blame. And at this point, Christianity has really taken off. Okay, it's starting, it, it was so popular, it was starting to politicize at this point. So it became a conflict between the Christians, the Jews, and the Romans. And once that plague starts hitting, okay, and it hits right here at Parousias. Once the plague starts hitting, there gets to be a sort of like the people, the mobs are starting to say, well, it's all those Christians' fault. It's very analogous to us going against Islam today. It's not a question about whether Islam is bad or not. Most people have no idea what Islam really is. It's actually half bad and half good. Okay, it doesn't mean it's true God, but it's, you know, half, of the, literally half, the Quran is divided into two parts. One part is called the Meccan surahs, which are all very nice. And that's what most Islamists, I mean, most um, Muslims focus on. But the other half, the Medina surahs, are really nasty. Kill the infidel. Jews will be hanging around trees waiting for you to come kill them. You know, anybody who's Muslim and he changes his mind doesn't want to be Muslim anymore, kill them. Those are the Medina surahs. Surah means chapter, section. Okay, so a whole bunch of people under Trump are like, well, you're a Muslim, so you're just automatically bad. And they just want him eradicated. They punch him, they abuse him, the whole bit. But that's what was going on toward Christians and Jews during this period. Because the plague hit Rome and it came from the Middle East. That same kind of ignorance. And some people were blaming Marcus Aurelius. So when the Christian of those days was saying, well, wait a minute, it's not my fault. This is a judgment from God because your Roman gods aren't gods at all. Well, you, guess how that went over. Not well. Okay, with me? All right, so now, what are the signs of the ending of the age? All right, so all of this upset over the plagues ended up at the end of this age 177 with a series of riots and mob upset against Christians and Jews especially at a place called Lyon in France they didn't call it Lyon in those days they called it Lugudnum okay and it was really fostered by the crowds but Marcus Aurelius didn't try to stop it I mean why should he he was big on well Rome is superior the Roman gods the Roman this the Roman that and he would have to be a little more strident even now that the plague was hitting because the Romans were very superstitious if you had a Pompey or you had a plague it, it meant that you had a bad ruler Okay, so he's going to have to defend against that. 
And in 177, the other big thing that happened, Commodus, who had been made Caesar, meaning heir apparent and the, by the, this time, the, the name Caesar, the meaning of the term changes. Commodus at age 5 was made Caesar, but here at the end, in 177 AD, he's made co-emperor. Alright? He grew up underneath the public eye as an emperor to be. So he was always fawned over and this and that and the other thing. With a Rome first culture, that would even be stronger. But here's the thing. Marcus Aurelius abandoned, didn't obey his own principle about being a philosopher king and governing by virtue and what's good and right and true. I mean, it, that's one of the things that Dio Cassius takes him to, to, to task for. It's like, hi, you're, you talk about all this virtue stuff, but you appoint people who don't have it. Okay, his own co-emperor, Lucius Verus, who ends up dying under the plague, there were several of them. It wasn't just one. It started in 165, though. Lucius Verus was something of a, a playboy and a gourmand. Ate and drank all the time. Okay, so was Domitian, his own son. And not Domitian, Commodus, his own son. Of course, he's really young at this point, but he's being, he's being trained that way. His wife. Marcus Aurelius' his own wife wasn't exactly faithful to him and he didn't do anything about it. So if you were close to him, you were a member of his entourage, all that talk about virtue and stoicism that he was so famous for went right out the window. Okay? So it was a kind of judgment, as it were, a set of bad things happening to Rome and so now when we got Apocrites coming up it's based on that foregoing alright and notice it's longer now as if you know as he, he doesn't need to say Ho Jesus Apen Autois he could just say Kai Apocrites or Kai Apocrites Apen Apen he doesn't have to say Ho oh, Jesus, and he doesn't have to say Autois. We already know who it is from the convo. So he's stretching out the text. It's really important. When you see text, it seems kind of like, why are there so many words, and why is it so repetitive? Probably because of the meter, because he wants to get to this end for the clause. This is 189 A.D. Commodus starts, I mean, See, the problem is that he's made co-emperor here in 177. So you could say Commodus starts, but his dad dies at Op. And whether you, you could even say his dad dies at Kai, depending on what fiscal year you use. Because he died in March. And in the Hebrew sacred calendar, that would be the prior year. Okay, in, in the, in the um, Roman calendar at this point, it's past January, so it's a new year. So we call it 180 AD. But if you're on a different fiscal year, it might still be the tail end of 79. But either way, the answer to this bad period here prior is Commodus. It's a result, just like there was a result of the temple falling down up here. So there's a result of all these mobs turning into Christian over false accusations. I'm not saying that the Christians were good. They weren't. They were sneaky. They were terrible during this time. But they didn't deserve to be persecuted. Alright? They didn't deserve that. And they were persecuted by mobs. Not really so much by Aurelius, but he didn't do anything to stop it. All in this fake, Oh, Rome first! Okay? So Apocrites is like answering back to Rome. Hi, you shouldn't have persecuted my people. Remember? History is determined. Moses 32.8, Deuteronomy 32.8, Acts 17.26. It's determined by believers. And you'll notice that this is a good period of growth here. Alright? 
the people we know of, you know, like the church fathers, they were not growing. But the ones who we don't know of, they were, because these are good numbers. And the addition of six, 42 and 21 is 63, which means it was time for voting to occur. In other words, due to the growth rate. And so we're going to have some, some nastiness happen here. Also, so there's a sort of judgment against the believers, but it's more a judgment against Rome for having the Romans, the people, all over the Roman ancient world were, you know, variantly doing this, for blaming Christians and Jews and persecuting. There was a lot of persecution that happened, but it wasn't, it wasn't by Marcus Aurelius sending some kind of decree about it. It was by the people not liking the Christians because they were busy, you know, with their own, going back to their own parochial Rome first, which had not been, not been, Roman policy. It's a jingoistic reversal, just as we're going through now in history, which is really important considering that we're, we're going to have this same language coming up for us. All right, but are you seeing the point? This was the bad prior, just like this was the bad prior, and then we have Apocrites. Now we have our second bad prior, okay, and then we have our second Apocrites. And basically what this is covering is the period from 177 to 185, right? Or n maybe not that long, 178, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, to 82. And that was a sort of honeymoon period for Commodus. By the end of 82, everybody started to want him dead. Okay? He did the same problem that the Tiberius did. He hired some guy. He said, okay, you just go run the empire and I, I'll go, go just play. Very similar to what Donald Trump is doing. Donald Trump is not running the presidency. He is a puppet of the people around him. Communists decided he wanted to be a puppet and just play all day and let somebody else run the, the empire. Okay? Same thing here. Alright, so this is bad for the Roman Empire. It is a result of what went before. It is a judgment against Romans for unfairly blaming Christians for the bad stuff that happens. Because, you know, when you're not believing in Christ, and even after you're saved, this happens too, God's going to start warning you after a while. And some of the warnings are going to be, like, nice things that shouldn't be there, and bad things that shouldn't be there. To make you think, well, why is this happening to me? Alright, so there's the, here's the juridical cause. You already had the plagues had started, so people should have been asking why, and they were. But they were drawing the wrong conclusions because they didn't want to blame their own emperor. So, and I'm, it really wasn't his fault. It was part of a warning by God. Hi, you guys aren't believing me, in me, even though my servants have been among you now for a hundred and some years. Okay, so wake up and smell the coffee. This is a sign. All right. So they're not listening to the sign, so now they're going to get the sign of a bad ruler, Commodus. And look at this. This is so cute. Remember how our boy Titus dies right there at the T. Alright. That's what makes me think that this is a keyword, because it's a keyword in Mark. Okay, now look. All right, this is 189. Le, pe, te. Three syllables. 189. If it's the end of 189, you got 190, 191, 192. Three syllables. And Commodus dies right there at the end of the word. Whereas Titus died not quite at the end of the word. Isn't that cute? He, he's tracking the death of the emperors using blepete. At least these two. Now what kills me is Paul does the same thing in Ephesians 1, 3-14. But you'll have to go watch those videos because I don't want to stray too much from this. 
All right, so the the emperor's death, the emperor's own death, is a judgment against him. Commodus was assassinated um, by being strangled in his bathtub by some guy hired by his girlfriend. He, I, I thought he liked his wife, but I was wrong about that. He had a girlfriend that he was loyal to, though. So, Blepite, at the end of Blepite, Commodus ain't seeing nothing, but everybody's seeing him. And they drag him in the Tiber, and they do all this nasty stuff. They hate him so much. Okay? And, <laughs> Blepite, may. Yeah, you're not seeing nothing anymore, honey. This one, Pertinax, starts. Okay? So what are we looking at? We do not have I'm in Lego Humin as explanatory text, but we do have the Lord talking. See to it that you're not, um, what do you want to call it, deceived. So after, after, see, this is Commodus coming into power right here. This is Commodus dying. And it's going to be real easy to think, oh, yeah, you know, this is the end of it. Everything's going to be fine now. Uh, don't be deceived by that. It's only going to get worse. And, of course, it does. Because, because after Pertinax, you have all kinds of little nonsense coming in. And uh, by 1999, by 199, actually starts at 195. So it would be day. Humas. So at that point, marked in black, that start. That's when Septimus Severus takes over. And then things get really bad because everybody's deceived. And at this point, marked in black is when Christians start to be the most deceived. Because back up here, during this time from 177 to 189, Commodus reverses something that could have been, but I'm not so sure it really was started by his dad. Commodus doesn't want to persecute the Christians. Okay? The riots and all that other good stuff that were going on against Christians taper off here, probably really, because they're so mad at Commodus. Because he was fine until he gets right here. And then starting right here, ha, 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 he wants to be their lord, renaming even Rome after himself. And they don't like that. So they're so mad at communists, they sort of forget about the Christians. Because he wants to be their lord, their savior. He thinks of himself as their savior. Jesus means savior. So you see how, how apt this wording is? I told you he padded, the, he padded the text to get to the right syllable count for a reason. Now we're finding out. So don't be... See to it that you're not deceived is exactly what everybody's disobeying, the Romans and the, the Christians. Because this is the period when our boy Irenaeus and Tertullian and Origen all get started. And by the end of this thing here, the people that are sitting in Africa, Origen being one of them, are thinking, oh, we can go convert those mothers. Yeah. And by here, they try to do it. And they end up, a lot of them end up dying as a result. But I digress. The point is, is that the text after Apocrites doesn't have Amen Lego Humin in it. But it still is something the Lord is saying. And what is he saying? See to it. Yeah, by the time you get there, there's nobody in the Imperial saying nothing. Okay? Don't be deceived. Oh, that's what everybody's going to do. Start being deceived. Oh, there's no more communists. Life's going to be good now. Oh, there's no more communists. Let's all fight each other in a new civil war over whether who's going to has been wrong. And the Christians, of course, are the most deceived of all because they're trying newly, under Irenaeus to start with, to turn Christianity into an institution based on a fakakta lie of apostolic succession, which starts getting cranked up here. Based on a guy who wouldn't know Judaism if it bit him. Okay? And Irenaeus turns that into some fantastic story about, oh, well, see, the, the, the 
we got we got the apostles appointing us and we have this unbroken line because our boy was so popular because Marcus Aurelius was so popular because Commodus his natural born son who he shouldn't have picked based on his own philosophy was turning everybody sour so now they're going back to the Christians again and this time listening to them so the Christians get all full of themselves and start making themselves into an institution by this point by the end here Tertullian is doing it or a little earlier in this in this period uh, Irenaeus is doing it he dies in 202 but his stuff had been out for about 20 years and that's one of the ways Tertullian and Origen got converted so what are we looking at here we're looking at the cause in this case it's 177 bound but it's actually representing a whole period okay then we're looking at the answer by the real Lord well okay down you go Marcus Aurelius and up comes Commodus to judge the Romans by being a bad leader for all their persecuting of Christians and accusing them of bringing the plague when they didn't okay so that's a result alright and then the content of the warning is setting up just like it did here hi what went before has a cause and here's here's what it is but by the way this same th event is going to have an effect on the future so the same content has in it a warning see the warning back up here when the temple went down is how you all going to be upset about this 84 years after I'm dead don't be upset let it go let it go because if he's saying it here when they know that it's occurring long after the temple is down what he's saying is it's going to stay down well if the Lord is telling you that the temple's going to stay down then you don't need a Kitos war same thing here don't be deceived well that's a warning that people are going to be deceived you don't need a warning for something that ain't going to happen so he's warning you of what's going to happen see to it that you're not deceived because Christians will be and they will be because they get a sort of like respite under communists and then they start institutionalizing themselves see how great we are we're Christians and that makes it all the more attractive because communists is such a bad ruler you see so everybody's gonna be deceived therefore he has to say see to it that you're not which is promptly during this time disobeyed so what does that mean then for the next time this stuff occurs alright and the next time it occurs is in Matthew 25 9 so there's a whole long thing here so what is that saying what was the prior occurrence well World War One so how is answering due to World War One which leads is the interim between World War One and two because World War Two is right here. So what does that tell us? And I'll have to get that in the next increment because my my voice is going.